Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me over for this interview. The documentation of Neil Bagh and the founder, David, is overdue, and I'm very happy that you're doing it. Um, as suggested by you, and I'm happy to begin with an unstructured, unprepared opener and then you will ask questions. I'll be prepared for that. So I've been thinking about where to begin. I suppose I can talk about three things, three spheres of uh, relationship with David. I can talk about him as a friend, as a family friend, actually. I can talk about my association with the school and his educational system. I can talk about his association with Bangalore Little Theatre and our common interest in theatre. The three spheres are terribly interconnected. They can't be separated. For convenience, I will begin in one, but don't be surprised if they intermingle. Um, <clears throat> David got active in Bangalore Little Theatre the year after I left Bangalore, I took a job in Ahmedabad and left in 1964. That seems a long time ago, doesn't it? And he got active at BLT 65, late 64, 65. Of course, he knew BLT and BLT knew him, but he was not active. He was, he had enough on his hands at the British Council. First in Madras, Chennai, and then in Bangalore. And it just happened that one of my contemporaries in college, quite senior to me, but he was in college at about the same time, he became David's right-hand man and Chela in developing MELT, British Council, Madras. He shifted to Bangalore and I left for Ahmedabad. Uh, he immediately got very active in BLT's productions, oh, much more than that. He was, he, he was a major influence on BLT in its, its productions, its policies, its practices, uh, extension work in schools, and so on. So I got to know him well only when I came down to Bangalore from Ahmedabad on a vacation and uh, he was already rehearsing his play, The Ungrateful Man, big cast. And I, I used to drop in at the rehearsals. And we got to know each other well in that trip. I had nothing to do with the rehearsal, I mean the production. I went back. After the vacation, I went back. And of course, I'd keep in touch. I would hear about things happening here and David getting more and more involved, more deeply involved as a director, as an actor, as a designer. He was very good with his hands. He did a lot of the set design and construction himself. Uh, 
And then when I came back from my uh, stint in Ahmedabad, in the year 1974, we got to know each other much better. By then, by the time I returned, he had left Bangalore and started Neelbag. He had given up his job and this is what he wanted to do. All his wonderful ideas about education and education to reach village children. He, put it on, he wanted to put it into practice. He acquired the land, gave up everything he had in Bangalore and moved. He had already moved by the time I returned. I think it's fairly well known why he chose that area. He had worked earlier in Rishi Valley School. He was familiar with that educational system, the work of Pierce, F.G. Pierce, uh, and that educational philosophy. He was quite attached to Rishi Valley School as a teacher. So, Madhanapalli drew him, and he really wanted to settle down there, and he set up the school there. Every time he came to Bangalore, which was quite often, he would call and we'd meet and we'd chat. We'd, I made a couple of trips to Neelbhav on his invitation. And very soon the friendship extended beyond me to the family. Uh, my daughters were very close to his granddaughters. <laughs> They played together, they romped about Nilbag together, and they're still in touch. Uh, so the, the friendship extended, and we gradually came to understand how much we had in common in terms of the outlook to education. And one of those visits to Bangalore, he sprung the question, would I become a trustee? Unhesitatingly, I said, yes, I would be a trustee. The other person on the trust who worked very closely with David and me and got to know him well and became a very good friend with Hassan Haidari, who is no more, who was um, a publisher but he was also the managing director of TI Cycles, part of that group of industries. So we got to know each other well. At that time, the sons were not deeply involved in the school. They had other things to do. But somewhere down the line, Nicholas, Nicky B, as he's known, decided that he wants to really live and work there and carry forward his father's work. His wife, Penelope Penny, uh, was into alternative medicine. She, in fact, had a herbal garden there. And she would formulate the medicines herself. So you had alternative education, you had alternative health systems. <laughs> Uh, so they, they really settled in very, very well in Neelbag and they were a great support to David and Doreen. In a lot of the talk about Neelbag, we tend to forget Doreen, remarkably talented woman, particularly in crafts. And sh she was really the strong backup for the arts program in Neelbag. So in one of the visits, I did a photo documentation, and, which I'm happy to share with you. And you'll see specimens of art and craft in, in Neelbag. So in a seamless sort of way, friendship merged into educational <laughs> program. And 
my getting drawn into the program. It wasn't difficult because when I shifted to Bangalore from uh, Ahmedabad, it was to join the faculty of the Indian Institute of Management here. It was a new institute. And a new institute tends to have much more academic freedom than a well-established, uh, you know, rigid system. So many of us in the faculty were keen to take management to new directions, and I was interested in development, social development, as it applies to sustainable agriculture and education and community health and so on. So my interest in David's system of the school system and his ideas of education were in a very natural sort of way. I was drawn to them. So I enjoyed the years serving as a trustee. There was not much I, I could, had to contribute. David was, his thinking was so complete that whatever new idea you had, he had already thought about it. <laughs> it, it he's quite an amazing person. I want to talk, uh, while at this, I want to talk about one of the most fascinating things that happened while I was there. Naturally, when a school gets successful, and it was no doubt very successful, the students were turning out to be unbelievably good, all-round development of personalities, excellent in studies, excellent in dealing with the world around them. When a school gets successful, there are the, the doubting Thomases, and they want to raise objections, they want to point out something. <laughs> so one of them asked, should our, uh, all your teaching is in English. What about Hindi as a national language? They said, sure. First of all, it's not a national language. Please be careful about the words you use. But it is a language of national importance. It's there on all your currency notes, so it's a <laughs> Sure, we'll teach Hindi, no problem. That somebody else said, but you know, the school is uh, in Karnataka. Kannada? Yeah, we'll teach Kannada. What's the problem? We'll have Kannada. And then somebody else points out, this is a Telugu-speaking area. It's the border of Andhra. Sure, we'll teach Telugu. <laughs> what he was trying to say was, this business of children being confused with too many languages is a lot of nonsense. Nature has designed the brain of growing children, particularly, to take eight to ten languages without going crazy. <laughs> the language policy is essentially a political agenda. It's got nothing to do with learning. It's got nothing to do with children's growth. And it certainly has got nothing to do with children's mental health. So the children in Nilbagh, and this was in my time, they could read, write, and speak in Telugu, Kannada, Hindi, and English. And they sang songs in about 50 languages. Anybody who visited Nilbagh had to leave a song behind. <laughs> so the children would learn the songs, they'd learn the meaning, and they'd sing the songs. It could be in Russian, it could be in Czech, it could be in Bangla, it could be in anything. 
And in a very quiet way, without preaching, without sermonizing, he showed what children are capable of when it comes to learning. English. The question was asked, why English in a post-independence India? Why English? This is a, you know the politics behind that. His answer was very simple. He said, until we have libraries in other languages which can deliver, you have to, have, you have to teach in English. Children must learn English because they have access to knowledge in English. And they must not simply learn, they must be proficient in English. And he had a wonderful library in a rural school. He had a wonderful library and children, children would enjoy reading texts. They had, they had books in other languages as well. But when you want to study subject matter, the others were poor substitutes. The best material was available in English. So he was very clear that it's not surface learning of English. The kids had to be proficient. This is where he brought in his master stroke. And this is David with an understanding of educational psychology and learning processes without going to a master's degree or a PhD in <laughs> educational psychology. He was very clear that language proficiency comes from listening to good language. It is not enough teaching them grammar sentence construction, and parroting texts. They have to speak good English, and for that they have to listen to good English. So they were constantly exposed to the heard language, including visiting dramatists, actors, poets, writers, and so on. He was very clear about this. You have to listen to good English. You cannot teach good English if the teacher speaks Kachara English. So they have to listen to good English. I'll cut a long story short. He put his students, a bunch of them, not all of them, into two cars, drove to Chennai, and did a reading of Julius Caesar at British Council the audience could not believe what they were hearing. These kids from rural Karnataka were so good, were really so good. But there are a couple of other innovations that he was well known for. One of them was in, in, in his own way, Breaking the boundaries between subjects. He saw uh, an essential interconnectedness across all categories of knowledge. And he was not for, this is a maths class, this is a physics class. Is, of course you need to work, study maths as maths. But what's the point in studying maths as maths if you can't connect it to what you're doing in the carpentry shed? And I learned a lot from it, from that. Because I used to run training programs for young fabricators in set design and props making. And I would work with young people who had never handled a saw. <laughs> in their lives. They've now got their hands dirty. And so I would deliberately give them a piece of wood and a new saw from the market 
and I'll explain what's meant by a new saw and what's called an unbroken saw and ask them to give a, take, try their hand at cutting it. They'd struggle, it wouldn't cut. And then I'd pick up an old saw and I'd cut and say, why is it, what's happening here? How, how is it that I can cut and you can't cut? And I'd get them to see that a new saw has teeth which are not splayed. In a working saw, one tooth is splayed to the right, one tooth is splayed to the left, one tooth is splayed to the right, one tooth is splayed to the left. And the teeth have a directionality. It will cut only in one direction. It will not cut in the other direction. Now, there's physics and mechanics behind this. All right. It's not carp just carpentry. Behind the craft, there's science. I'm just giving that as one little example. And then pe and young people are thrilled. Ha! Ah, it cuts in the forward stroke. It doesn't cut in the backward stroke. Cut, no cut. Then I'd give them another saw. This is a Punjabi saw. Punjabi carpenters cut in the reverse stroke. <laughs> it will cut when you pull. It will not cut when you push. But that's the Punjabi tradition. God knows why and where it came from. Okay, so <clears throat> enough of saws and cutting wood. Uh, so he f believed strongly in the need for students to go beyond disciplined borders. And finally, of course, he invested in teacher training, saying, this is methodology that I have arrived at. How do we make sure that this is carried forward? So he had, in my time, at I don't know if there were more later on, but in, for instance, in Nicholas's time, but uh, I've seen two batches of teacher trainees. They'd go to Neil Bagh, live there, work with the students. And the first requirement was unlearning everything they had learned in teacher training institutes. And they had to learn how to work with children afresh absolutely afresh. And all of this would be meticulously and systematically documented and encourage them to open schools using this philosophy, this methodology. So that was a good thing he did, investing in that. Knowing at the back of his head that a little thing like this is not going to change the educational system in the country. It's too deeply entrenched. But whatever he could do. So teacher training was uh, an extremely important, it was important to him. Passing this on. And they learned the right methods. A lot of it is what you would today call non-didactic methods of, you needed facilitator skills. You didn't give answers directly, but you encouraged children to explore on their own and arrive at. Now this is a very, there's a very deep psychological principle behind this in, in cognitive psychology, in learning psychology. When a person arrives at an insight by oneself, the learning is stronger and is more enduring, it stays with you. If you're given the answer, it's prone to being lost very quickly. So this idea it has an absolutely strong scientific principle that students must arrive at truths by themselves. So the broad category is non-didactic teaching. So to go back to the days when Neil, Neil Bagh was prosperous and doing well, 
and there was a trust. People like Ahsan and myself, we were so confident and so sure of David knowing his mind, David knowing exactly what to do, we wouldn't interfere. Not in the educational content or educational philosophy. Hassan being an industrialist, he could comment on funds, sources of funds, and so on. I was at the Institute of Management, but I, so I could comment on organizational and management aspects. But we would never interfere in the educational programs. At one time, funds were adequate, enough to run Neilbagh and also to support the teachers trained in Neilbagh and starting schools on their own. Not entirely, but subsidizing these schools. Um, I was in touch with four of them for some time. And I know that the subsidy meant a lot, although it was not entire funding. So it seemed adequate. Uh, when David passed away, the charismatic leader that he was, it was not unnatural that funding also became You know how this works in, in this country. People fund a person, not the program. <laughs> uh, so funding was proving to be difficult. So it just happened. This is my way of looking at it. I might not be fully correct. There are multiple factors. One is the reduction in funds and the, and the reasons for the reduction in funds. But it also has to do with the schools reducing in number. So the need for funds for the schools started coming down. And so then some of them came up. One of the students of David married to an aeronautical scientist was disillusioned with mainstream technology and wanted to do education, alternative education. They married, they set up a school. So some of them needed funds. One source among others, was a small group in the United States. Nikki will tell you more about this. They would contribute as a group, and that money would come to the trust and from the trust to Sumovanam. It kept Sumovanam going. Now, as I understand it, that group is also drying up. Funds from there are drying up. That's my last understanding of the funding. Now, whether it's the, it's the group that lost interest or the group was not satisfied, we don't know. At least I don't know. Now, a lot of my professional work over many years as a management person, a lot of my professional work has been in uh, large social programs, social development programs, including management of non-profit organizations. 
Now, I know that this is a widespread problem in the nonprofit development sector. The head of an NGO, not always, but typically, wants people to give money and not ask questions. But those who give money are entitled to a report of how the money was used. Nothing wrong in that. NGOs don't think it necessary to report. So this is not uncommon that there is friction there. Now suppose an NGO is receiving funds from four sources. That means they have to report four times. The NGO finds it taxing. Four accounting systems, four reporting systems, you know. So they said, give us the money and leave us alone. To cut a long story short, the trust exists today on paper, but it's any minute now, any day now, it will be formally closed. I'm not a member of the trust anymore. I saw that I was not giving enough to the trust. And complementing that, I was being drawn into too many other preoccupations, so I asked to be excused. I'm not, I'm not a member of the trust anymore. I continue to stay in touch with Nikki. Again, it's more a family connection than anything else. We don't talk education. <laughs> uh, but I'm not a member of the trust. So finally, we can talk about the theater. It's the theater that really brought us together. Uh, and it's an area in which, surprisingly, we did very little work together. But it's an area which held us together. <laughs> because his active years was exactly when I was in Ahmedabad. So there were a couple of things we did together. I think the starting point is really the, what we've touched upon, not put it explicitly, but we've touched upon it. The starting point is the extraordinarily multifaceted, multi-talented personality that David was. I mean, he would amaze you with how many things he could do <laughs> and how many things he knew. So in the theater too, he was an outstanding designer. He was an actor too. And if he touched, if he picked up a play, he would do an outstanding job as, a, as an actor. But he was really a shade higher in the talent in designing, fabricating, uh, and everything that goes with it. Fabricating includes things like finishing, painting, uh, everything. This is important because he was an inspiration to others. You know, the caste system in India creeps into all, all walks of life, including the theater. We don't cut wood ourselves. We give it to a carpenter outside. We outsource a lot of our stage work. We just want to act. Give me a good script, preferably one with a big part. I want to act. This is sad. And it's very peculiar to a post-colonial society like India. David was an inspiration. Because there's nothing he didn't do. And there's nothing he couldn't do. <laughs> right? And that was his major contribution to Bangalore Little Theatre getting all members to, to look at the pursuit of theater as a highly multifaceted activity, and every one of them to be proud of. 
Ein My first encounter was around his own play. It was a tale from the Panchatantra called The Ungrateful Man. Here's a white man from England, settled in India, who knows, who knows Sanskrit. He writes a play on the Panchatantra and it becomes a hit. It becomes in the National School of Drama and NSD the benchmark for children's theatre. The, the play was so successful, but B.B. Karant picked it up and did it in NSD. And he, till today they talk about it as the benchmark of children's theatre. That was my first encounter with him. Uh, and that's way back in 66. Many years later, 79, we revived the play. And David came all the way from Nilbark to take part on the stage. <laughs> and he had the boys in Nilbark construct the sets. So one of our members, the stage manager, drove the whole set, all the sets, the whole collection of sets, in a truck to Bangalore, straight to Ravindra Kalakshetra and we set it up. So we took part in a play together just once. He and I. But we were constantly in touch. I took to writing a little late in life and I would send scripts to him to comment. He would get his students to try them out. But I'm afraid it was just that. I mean, there wasn't active participation together. But I know that whoever worked with him was in awe of David as the complete dramatist. Now what's interesting here is, as in education, he didn't have drama education. He didn't go to drama school. But he was so, he was so proficient. So, uh, we, right now, as part of uh, BLT's Diamond Jubilee celebrations, at least one thing has not been affected by the COVID pandemic. It's a huge publications project. We're bringing out all the plays developed within BLT over all these years, and they're 10 volumes of plays, about 60 plays. And naturally, David's Ungrateful Man stands out in the very first volume, <laughs> in the very first set of volumes. The first three volumes are out. Uh, they're available on, on Amazon and Flipkart. Uh, the next three volumes, four, five, and six, should be out in October. And seven, eight, nine, ten will come out early 2022. I'm the series editor. I, I, I was privileged to be asked to be the series editor and I, I took the job happily. But. David is remembered in the very first collection of children's theatre plays.